Welcome to our lecture on New York State Penal Law Article 156. My name is Adam Scott Want, professor and technologist from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. New York State Penal Law Article 156 is titled Offenses Involving Computers. In order for you to follow along with us today, you should print out New York State Penal Law Article 156 and have it in front of you the entire time. While we're doing our best in this lecture to get you text that you could read on the screen, ultimately when doing law and learning law, there's a lot of little text and a lot of small words. So if you have the statute open in front of you, it would be, you would be much better off. The point of this is to show you that the statute is extremely complicated. There's simply too much here on the screen for you to read. New York State Penal Law Article 156, Offenses Involving Computers, is broken down into different subsections. Subsection 00, for example, is the definition of terms. Subsection 05 is an authorized use of a computer, and so on. What's important to realize is that New York State Penal Law Article 156 is a compilation of many different subsections that overall govern how people could use computers in the state of New York. However, it is not by any way the only piece of law out there that governs how people could use computers in the state of New York, and there are actually many other sections of New York State penal law and other laws in general, in general that you would have to know. So let's start off by looking at the definition of terms. One fifty six zero zero, which is definitions, gives us a, a list of definitions, and if you see it in front of you, you could see all the definitions. Um, it defines words like computer and computer program and computer data and computer service. However, nothing is more complicated than two of the definitions, computer materials and without authorization. So let's take a little bit deeper look at these two definitions to see what they actually mean. Computer program versus computer data versus computer material. There are three words that sound kind of the same, but are they the same? If we break them down into three categories, what falls into each one of these categories? I know there's a lot of small words here, but follow along with us on your own printout. Computer program, first of all, the, the, the statute tells us it's property. So it's actual, physical, tangible, intellectual property or, or, or other type of property. And it basically means that it is an ordered set of data representing coded instructions or statements that when executed by the computer causes the computer to process the data or direct the computer to perform one or more operations or both and may be in any form, including magnetic media, punch cards stored internally in the memory of the computer. This is a complicated definition. It's so complicated we can narrow it down. A computer program is exactly what it sounds like. It's a computer program. It's a set of instructions, digital instructions, that tells a computer what to do. Chances are, what you think of as a computer program is a computer program, and that's not a difficult definition. Computer data is another definition in New York State Penal Law Article 156. Computer data is defined as that it is also property, so it's tangible property or intellectual property, and it means a representation of information, knowledge, facts, or concepts, or instructions which are being processed or have been processed or have been processed in a computer and may be in any form, including magnetic media, punch cards, stored in, or stored internally on a computer. What this basically means is that computer data is what you think it is. It's the data that's on the computer. It could be the data on your flash drive. It could be the data on your computer. It could be data in many different types. It could be MP3 music files. It could be Word documents. It could be Excel spreadsheets. It could be pictures. These all fall into the category of computer data. And generally, computer data means what you think it means. The third definition is far more complicated, computer materials. Computer materials are computer programs or computer data that fall into one of three categories. Category one is it's a type of medical record. Category two, and I'm boiling this down from the legislation, so take a really good look at the act, but category two is personally identifiable private information. And category three is private information, which would give somebody else an advantage. 
So if you look at this and now and, and boil it down, while my definition might be a little simplistic, it kind of is an easy way of understanding this. Computer material means computer programs or data that's meant to be kept private. And it's a little more complicated than that, as you can see in the statute. But whether it's health records or private data, computer materials, it's the privacy that's important. So whenever you see computer materials, whether it's on the midterm or in a question in class, whenever you see the term computer materials, you should think to yourself, materials equals private. And if it's something that's supposed to be private, chances are it's a computer material. So that kind of helps us understand the difference between computer programs, computer data, and computer material. Again, programs are what they probably seem to be, data is probably what it seems to be, and material equals private. The next definition we need to understand, which is very difficult, is the definition without authorization. And I've boiled this down and I've narrowed it down a little bit and simplified it on the screen, but follow along at home and you'll see that authorization basically, without authorization, doesn't mean what you think it means. When I think of without authorization, I think it means you do it without permission. Without authorization, without permission, kind of sounds the same. But that's not what it is in the New York State law. And if you think without authorization means without permission, you're very wrong. Without authorization means to use a computer without the permission of the owner after actual notice to such person has been given. So what it basically means is whenever in a New York State statute involving 156 you see the term without authorization, you need to ask has the person been told no? Because they're not only using it without permission, they're using it after actual notice to that person has been given. So just not having the permission is not enough. You have to be told, no, do not use the computer. So how must the person be told, no, they may not use the computer? Well, we really don't know because the law just changed and there aren't ample court cases to be able to figure that out. However, the law used to outline three different ways. And it's safe to say that if one of those older three ways are used, it probably still good although we'll have to wait to see how the courts decide going forward. So the three ways that the statute used to define specifically, which was taking out, is being told no verbally or by written notification, such as in a work policy, notice on or adjacent to the computer, and that would be like posting a sign next to the computer, or verbal or electronic warnings from the computer. So there's an actual message electronically on the computer that states who could use the computer. Now, these used to be the only ways a defendant could be told no. However, going forward, there probably are a lot more ways that could be used now because these three specific methods have been taken out of New York State Penal Law Article 156. There is one exception to without authorization. As I told you before, when somebody accesses a computer without authorization, they're first being told no. However, there's one exception and that's accessing a computer service. If you're accessing a computer service such as Dropbox or an email service, you don't first need to be told no. Oop, slide changed. If you're accessing a computer service, you don't first need to be told no. You, accessing a computer service, you know whether or not you kind of should be accessing it. And let's face it, if you're accessing somebody else's Dropbox account or somebody else's Amazon storage account or somebody else's email account, you shouldn't have to be told no first. So if you're accessing a computer service, you don't first need to be told no. So that's what you need to know about the definition. So now let's get into the heart of this. Let's get into the several subsections that are the statutes that people need to follow because if they break, there are criminal penalties. The first statute is New York State Penal Law Article 156.05, Unauthorized Use of a Computer. It's the first actual law we're about to discuss. Somebody is guilty of violating unauthorized use of a computer when they knowingly use a computer without authorization. Now, I'm boiling it down and simplifying it a little bit, so take a closer look at the penal law. But ultimately, this statute is about somebody using a computer after being told no, unless it's a computer service. 
It's a Class A misdemeanor, which means it's punishable by up to a year in prison. The second statute that we're going to look at is computer trespass. Now, it's important to remember that we'll be looking at several different subsections of the statute and that defendants could normally be charged with multiple subsections unless it's what's called a lesser included crime. For more information on a lesser included crime and what it means, see my other podcast that will be up on the screen. So let's move on now. Computer trespass, which is 156.10. Somebody is guilty of computer trespass when they knowingly use a computer service without authorization and something else happens. So you need to have committed the first crime, which is unauthorized use of a computer, and there's a mitigating factor, and it's one of two different things. Number one is that you do so with the intent to commit a felony. Number two is that you knowingly gain access to computer material. So let's review what we just learned because it's a little bit complicated, and to do so I'm going to go back to the last slide. Somebody is guilty of unauthorized use of a computer, which is a Class A misdemeanor, if they use a computer without authorization. And in most cases, that means they're told no first. However, it could become a more serious offense if one of two mitigating factors are true. It becomes a Class E felony, chargeable under computer trespass, if on top of using a computer without authorization, Either you do so with the intent to commit or further a felony, or, number two, you knowingly gain access to private material, computer material. And that's what's important to remember here. If you're using somebody's computer without authorization, that's one thing. However, if you're gaining access to their private files, or if you're doing so with a criminal intent, you should be punished more as a criminal. So that's why if you violate computer trespass, it's a Class E felony, which means you could spend more than a year in prison. Let's move on to 156.20, computer tampering in the fourth degree. Now, computer tampering is a little complicated because there are four different degrees of computer tampering. Let's start with the lowest degree, degree number four. Computer tampering is when you use a computer without authorization and intentionally alter in any manner data or program of another person. Now, obviously, I'm simplifying this law a little bit, so read along from home. However, what's important to realize here is that the lowest degree of computer tampering, com number four, is a Class A misdemeanor. So you could spend up to a year in jail for it. Now, this is pretty simple and it's very straightforward. Whenever you think of computer tampering, in your mind, you should think tampering means to alter. Again, tampering means to alter. And, as you will learn in the case law in a separate podcast, alteration means any change whatsoever, even a minute change. The New York State Court of Appeals in the People v. Versagi held that even the slightest alteration of what a computer is made to do, their task it's made to perform, or the data on the computer is, a, is an alteration and therefore it's computer tampering. So it doesn't have to be destructive and it doesn't have to be significant. If you use somebody else's computer without their permission and you change the data or programs on that computer, you are tampering with their computer and therefore in itself could be charged under New York State Penal Law Section 156.20, Computer Tampering Fourth. It's a Class A misdemeanor. However, if we mitigate it and if we make it worse, we go to computer tampering in the third degree. Computer tampering in the third degree is worse than computer tampering in the fourth degree, and it in itself is a Class E felony, which means you could spend at least a year in prison. So, how do you commit computer tampering in the third degree? Well, it's pretty simple. You start off by committing computer tampering in the fourth degree, but you do something to aggravate it and make it the higher crime. So, in order to commit computer tampering three, you first commit computer tampering for and one of several other aggravating facts is true. Number one, you're doing it with the intention to commit a felony. Number two, it's being done by somebody who's previously been convicted of any crime under New York State Penal Law Article 156. If you've already committed a computer crime once, the second time we're going to treat you a little bit harsher. The third is that 
you intentionally alter in any manner or destroy computer material. So if you're going in there and you're intentionally going after computer material, it aggravates it. Number four, you intentionally alter computer data or any computer program that causes damages in an aggregate that exceeds $1,000. So if you go into somebody's computer and you damage them by deleting files and that causes them more than $1,000 worth of damage, we have computer tampering three. Now, it's very easy to cause somebody $1,000 worth of damage. If you delete one video that I'm editing and working on and that video takes more than two or three hours of my time to reconstruct it, and my argument is that I bill for two or three hundred dollars an hour, well then you've already created that a thousand dollars worth of damage just by damaging one file. It is very easy to get to that one thousand dollars worth of damage no matter how much damage you create. So the defendants need to be very careful here. Let's go to the next degree. 156.26 computer tampering in the second degree. So how do you commit this? It's pretty simple. You commit computer tampering in the fourth degree, which is aggravated by one of two things. The damage is in excess of $3,000 or it involves medical records with some sort of injury to, the, to somebody. And it's important that you go in and read the statute very carefully because ultimately I'm simplifying it and boiling it down a little bit, but those are the two aggravating circumstances. More than $3,000 in damage or number two, it involves medical records and there's an injury that occurs from there. Ultimately, we're talking about a class D felony here. So it's pretty serious. You could be in prison for more than three years at this point. Let's give an example of what we're talking about when we mean medical records with injury. Let's say a person is going in for a surgery and you hack the records, the medical records, and instead of them operating on the right arm, you change the records to mean the left arm that would qualify under this section. But it doesn't have to be such a big injury. It could be something much smaller. Uh, maybe you hack into a calendar of a medical office to give yourself an appointment and you knock somebody else's appointment out of the calendar. I want an appointment with my doctor. There is no appointment. Somebody hacks into the calendar. They add me. They remove somebody else. Now let's say that person gets sicker because they missed that appointment or because the doctor was seeing you instead. That also would qualify as 156.26, computer tampering in the second degree. And it's a very serious offense as a Class D felony. However, it could get worse. We have computer tampering in the first degree, a Class C felony. Now, if a defendant is convicted of this, they'll be spending some major time in prison. A person's guilty of this when they commit the crime of computer tampering in the fourth degree and they intentionally alter in any manner or destroy computer data or computer programs in an excess of $50,000. So computer tampering in the third degree was excess of one. Computer tampering in the second degree was an excess of $3,000. And computer tampering in the third degree is in an excess of $50,000. As you do more damage, the charges increase. Now, it is really important here that we are very careful when we realize how easy it is to cause $50,000 in damage. There are computers all over John Jay that professionals work at, professional video editors, media editors, uh, policy experts. If you destroy one of their computers, a computer that they spend months of their life programming or creating materials for, and if that material is not backed up, you could instantly cause $50,000 worth of damage. So just by damaging one computer, you could very quickly cause $50,000 in damage, which would be a charge of 156.27, computer tampering in the first degree. It's a class C felony, so it's very serious. Let's move on. So next let's focus on unlawful duplication of computer-related material. It is unlawful in some circumstances to make a copy of computer information, computer data, computer programs. There are two or three major categories where it's illegal to make a copy. Let's talk about those real quick. Category one is a class B misdemeanor and would result in you being charged with unlawful duplication of computer related material in the second degree. Category number one is medical records. If you copy medical records without the right to do so, you might be guilty of unlawful duplication in the second degree. That's category one. It's class B misdemeanor. Honestly, somebody who does this, they're not going to be punished. 
unless they're a serial offender of some sort. Maybe they'll get probation. Chances are it'll just be dismissed after a few months. Unlawful duplication of computer-related material in the first degree has the two other categories. Category one is somebody who copies something and due to that copying, the original owner is deprived $2,500 or more in value. This could happen very easily when somebody copies, let's say somebody's working for John Jay College recruiting students and they have a list of students that they want to go and recruit. And they're recruiting those students, but in the middle of recruiting the students, they get fired from John Jay College. Now, they're not supposed to make a, they're not supposed to take with them a list of these students, but they make an illegal copy of that list. And then they go to their next university, where they then try to recruit the students to that second university. Now, they were never supposed to take the list from the first university, and then they went to the second, and if they deprive John Jay of $2,500 worth of materials, worth of people, worth of profit, then that person could be guilty of this. I know it sounds a little bit complicated, but the ultimate idea behind 156.31 is that a defendant copies materials and then uses them to profit. And in doing so, he is depriving a owner of $2,500 in value. Now, there's a couple other ways this could happen. Let's look at one of them. Let's say Sony BMG, the music record, has songs out there, which they do, and they own the songs. Let's say you illegally download their songs, and their songs are valued at a dollar each. Well, if you illegally download 2,500 songs or more from Sony, and if they're, down, if they're valued at a dollar each, just by illegally downloading that music at home, you might have committed this offense. The third category is if you are committing the offense with the attempt to commit a felony. So if you're making copies of any data that you don't have the right to copy, and you're doing so with the intention of committing a felony, you're committing unlawful duplication of computer-related material in the first degree, which in itself is a felony. So let's say you're going to harm somebody. Let's say a defendant is going to harm somebody, and they're stalking them. And in order to stalk them, they break into town hall, and they copy, they steal, the blueprint to that person's house, to the victim's house. Just the copying of that blueprint because they want to use them to commit a felony is in itself unlawful duplication of computer-related material in the first degree if the blueprints were kept on a computer. Now, there are lots of scenarios here and they're hard to get into, um, but we'll talk more about them in class. So not only is it illegal to duplicate the material, it's also illegal to possess it. Computer, it's called criminal possession of computer-related material, and it's 156.35. Having no right to do so, a defendant knowingly possesses, so it's the possess it, possession, in any form, any copy, reproduction, or duplication of any computer data or computer program which was copied or reproduced in violation of the sections we just read. So we just talked about how it's illegal to duplicate some material. Well, even after you've duplicated it, it could still be illegal to possess it. You could illegally possess marijuana, you could illegally possess a handgun, and you could also illegally possess data if the data you have was copied illegally. It's a classy felony, which means that you could serve a year or more in jail for it, in prison. So that wraps up all the individual sections, but there's still one or two things we need to look at. One of them is defenses. If you've committed a crime, there are certain defenses which might negate the criminal liability. One of those defenses applies to each section of the law that we just went over. And I think it's really weird. You could tell me if you think it's weird too in the comments section below. But New York State has something odd in its law. Something that almost no other state in the union has. Under 156.5, it specifically says that if the defendant had reasonable grounds to believe they could do what they did, that it's a defense to the crime. So what they're basically saying, and I think they're doing this because people are still very uncomfortable with computer crimes. We don't want to accidentally charge somebody with a computer crime who shouldn't be charged with a computer crime. And if we do, we definitely don't want them convicted of a computer crime. So what I think the legislature is trying to do, and I think this because I've reviewed their notes, I've reviewed the legislative history, what the legislature is trying to do with this defense is that if there's somebody who committed the crime 
but they're really a good person who had the grounds to believe they could do it, well, then we're not going to convict them of the crime. We're really only going after people who knew they were wrong. Or in the other way of saying it is if somebody honestly believed they were in the right, if they had a real ground to believe that they were in the right, we're not going to convict them of the crime. Now, who's it up to believe that? Probably the jury. It would probably, probably be the jury that had to do, decide whether or not the defendant had the reasonable ground to believe. And it would be up to the defendant to convince the jury that he did. So, let's review. We went over one, two, three, four, five, six major issues here. Six major concepts. Seven if you include the definitions. We went over unauthorized use of a computer. We went over computer trespass. We went over four degrees of computer tampering in the first, second, third, and fourth. We went over, we went over unlawful duplication in the first and second degree. We went over criminal possession, and we went over defenses. There are several cases that are important here, and I'll have another podcast that go over these cases. But some of the base cases, some of the most important cases in New York State, are the People versus Catacan, People versus Versagi, People versus Garcia, People versus O'Grady, and People versus Angelis. And again, I'll have additional podcasts on these for you to follow up with them as well. Well, that's it for New York State Penal Law Article 156. I hope that this podcast has been enlightening to you. It's important to remember that the law changes every year, so this podcast will only be good for a certain amount of time. I'll make sure in the notes section below this podcast, I keep records as to how often this podcast is certified as being accurate. My name is Adam Scott Want. I'm a professor and technologist at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, which is part of the City University of New York, and this has been a podcast on New York State Penal Law Article 156.